I started out um, of college, uh, one of the first demonstration programs for child abuse, uh, went to the Department of Mental Hygiene when the institutions were being closed and uh, people with developmental d disabilities were being resettled. Um, I actually got into politics. I ended up having a, 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 a chief uh, fiscal officer position and ended up uh, having a career, a professional career, on labor economics, government uh, finance, both state and local. I started to enjoy babysitting um, probably about 10 years ago. And about seven years ago into my life came my um, oldest daughter's um, oldest child. And uh, she was a, a, a zebra. She was a child with a rare disorder. Uh, there's a saying in, in medicine that uh, if you hear hoofbeats uh, when you turn around, don't expect to see zebras. That essentially presents an, an, an enormous burden, an enormous problem within the medical system and for people who have rare diseases and families that care for them. Uh, you look for the obvious, you look for the common. It's much easier to diagnose a common cold. There's a one-to-one -one chance every physician in the world would know what a common cold is. Uh, but there's not always that chance when it comes to rare diseases. Here are my zebras. The little girl you see on your left is going to be seven in January. Six weeks of age, she had seizures, early onset seizures, and diagnosed at uh, the age of two with CDKL5, which I'll explain. Um, she will never walk, she will never talk, uh, and she has very limited use of her hands. The, the beautiful little girl you see on your right is Emily. Uh, at two days of age, at uh, two days old, she lost about 99% of her small intestines. And uh, um, now I, I'm going to interject here. My life is full of joy. It really is. There's no greater experience I've ever had. And these kids are thriving. So it, 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 good things are happening, especially when you're, you're pressed and you have the right motivation. Emily lives with a permanent IV line, ileostomy bag, and a tummy tube. I am sorry, what did I do? There. Here's a little look at rare diseases. There are about 7,000 or so. When you look at all the different types, there's probably about 50. It affects 32 million Americans. Seven and a half years to get your average diagnosis after seeing eight doctors. Uh, and the process to uh, secure those diagnoses is uh, aggravating and catastrophic at best. There are virtually no cures and no therapeutics. 80% are genetic in origin. We haven't advanced as fast as you think we might have with uh, genetics. Therefore, there aren't any cures. It's very difficult to get testing. No one's really doing clinical testing for rare disorders, with the exception of one small group out in California. The care required for most rare disorders is long-term, chronic, and complex. When it comes to rare disorders, and I've already mentioned this, it becomes obvious anyone can diagnose the common cold. Everyone has one. It's easy for doctors to do that. Now, when they don't know, the odds change. That beautiful girl, back a few slides, Haley, who's going to be seven, has CDKL5. It's a, it's a mutant gene. Uh, it deprives her of a protein necessary for synaptic growth. That's why she's pervasively handicapped. She's one of 600 known or diagnosed. If, if you do math, that's about one in every 10 million. That's less than two people in all of New York State. It's hard to find a support group. Emily. I had to do some quick figuring on Emily. I made up my own ratio here. Um, she's got less than um, eight centimeters of small intestine. The literature tells me maybe that's one in every 350,000. When doctors don't know, when you're wandering around for years, and as a result of my position down at Albany Med, I'm running into more cases where people can't get a diagnosis. I just referred a woman to a genetics clinic out in California, 19 years old, her daughter is, and she still doesn't have a diagnosis. What can we expect? Well, 
You can't expect a physician to set up a practice where something is one in 10 million. Nor can you expect them to be prepared and competent if they show up. But doctors, and God bless them, I'm not here to complain about it. They're not trained for things so rare. And it provides a doctor, uh, 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 doctors want to heal. We all, we've all probably read articles with respect to um, um, you know, how doctors handle death. They don't like it, they don't do it very well. So where does that leave us, zebras? If truth be told, it, it really is entirely uh, upon your own expectations. If your expectations are whole, so high and think that they know, it's, it, it adds a tragedy to an already difficult position. So to tell you the truth, I don't expect to see real treatments and cures for my Haley in my lifetime. It's very complicated. We know, we know very little about you know, rare disorders and genetics, despite the fact of what you read. And I don't expect my medical system to make the heartache go away, the loss of, of, of a perfect child, if you will. But that wasn't always so. The grief attendant is crushing. Not knowing when, where, and how your child will die can be paralyzing at first. Your pursuit may become maniacal. Look at me. <laughs> and when you are not maniacal, the depression can be oppressive. At this moment in my life, I just expect the medical system and doctors to listen to me. Like millions of caregivers and patients living with rare disorders, we become the experts. I take, I'm a pediatric short bowel clinic at home. I know how to handle an IV line, ostomy bag, you know, excoriated skin, the, the tummy tube type of thing. Um, we're real battlefield veterans, but yet, within the medical system, we're not venerated. We're, we're, we're not seen as experts, despite the fact that a lot of heroes running in and out of a doctor's office are the mothers bringing in their children the daughter bringing in her mother. Those are the real experts, but yet we're not validated. This is my Haley. <clears throat> Starts in the first few months of life, and I'm gonna give you a couple of illustrations. They can't walk, they can't talk, they can't feed themselves, they're combined to wheelchair, and the, the last paragraph does not apply to my Haley. She's one of the fortunate ones with, with uh, her um, uh, CDKL5 diagnosis. She only has intractable epilepsy, plus I notice I said only. <laughs> um, and we're grateful for that. There's only about 300 families registered in the International Foundation of um, CDKL5 uh, research worldwide. Yet, this is what happens to parents who real, and parents and caregivers who decide to move the world when there aren't any cures. Our group drives a million dollars worth of major research projects, including stem cell stuff, all around the world. I'm not gonna read this one all to you. I'd like you to start reading it. And when you read it, and as you read it closely, thinking, think about living with this baby every night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and never, the baby, if you read that full thing, probably never is out of, uh, discomfort or pain. This is the oppressive part, and it's fatal. That one fatality, that, that particular uh, disease created that center. Now the person who created it, the parents who created it, had a lot of money and a lot of power. It was anybody who knows football, it's uh, Jim Kelly, Buffalo, uh, Buffalo Bills quarterback. His child had crab aid disease. This is my success, this is Haley. I told you she couldn't walk, couldn't talk, can't use her hands. She is talking on a computer. She can look at that thing with her eyes and say, I'm happy, I'm sad, I want a drink, I want whatever. And we're starting to build a vocabulary. So that's my own personal uh, um, success. This is a brochure that came about as a result of a letter and a draft proposal to Albany Medical Center, Albany um, <coughs> Medical College, and Albany uh, Medical Center's foundation. As a parent, 
playing in the trenches with two rare disease kids over a seven year period, I sat down on December the 7th and said, essentially, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you what the whole letter was, you have gotta pick up your speed on rare diseases. My medical home is here, I can't afford to go to Boston all the time. It got vetted by the deans, it got uh, vetted by um, uh, a few VPs at Albany Medical Center, and <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, it gave me a career that gave me what I wanted, a small budget and a chance for a conference uh, last February. And it was attended by all kinds of stakeholders, patients, caregivers, pharmacy companies, equipment companies, foundation heads, doctors stopped in. As of November 1, there is a New York State Rare Disease Alliance. We have a number of goals to manage the diagnostic process, to manage the long-term care process, and there are serious weaknesses local, locally in all these. Uh, the build the architecture for portable electronic records. I want parents who are having a hard time getting a diagnosis because there are no doctors around here to have a thumb drive and be able to send them over to Boston or uh, Philadelphia or the Mayo Clinic, I don't care where, be able to do that, including all the imaging that, that may go along with it. Also to build a good navigator group uh, uh, experience with this. Also to build relationships with our, with our state officials and also promote basic research. Not just research that helps CDKL5, but research that helps uh, uh, whole categories of rare disorders. And I'll give you one. We're going to feature it at our convention in February. Uh, there's a blood-brain barrier. It reduces the efficiency of any drug trying to go into the central nervous system. And just think, not just epilepsy, but almost anything driven by the central nervous system, its efficiency is reduced because we don't know the secrets to the blood-brain barrier. And that would, that would help hundreds, if not thousands, of, of rare disorders, not the least of which would be Alzheimer's, which isn't rare. When doctors don't know, we have to act, we have to challenge them, and we have to help them. Now, I want to stick on this for just a minute. I have lived a life of advocacy. I can be very pushy. I've learned how to speak. I've learned how to think. I've learned how to present a case. And I simply came to them, and I ended up as chairman of an all-physician committee at Albany Med in the pediatric department trying to start a rare disorder clinic because I said you need help. It is not comfortable to sit before a rare disease as a doctor and not know what you're talking about and refer it to a board-certified friend, and they don't know. And then if the family can't travel to Boston or Philadelphia, it is even then more heartbreaking. And it actually, if, even if they delve in, the reimbursement system does not give them the time. Yeah, everybody here knows, go to the doctor in out 15 minutes. You can't do that with a rare disorder. And as I wrap up here, I want to give a salute to all of our brethren internationally who, who deal with rare diseases. There are virtually almost a thousand rare disorder organizations individually. With parents and caregivers who at times can, are seen as maniacal. And they create organizations and they raise a lot of money. And strangely enough, I want you to consider something. Find people around you who have rare disorders and really take a look at them. And if you really take a look at them in a studious fashion, you will see that rare disorders, when they are cut up, take the symptomatology apart, are nothing more than an exorbitant expression of common disorders. Take away our coordination. Make it real bad. You'll not be able to walk as Haley. Haley can get up there and try and take steps. She has to be held up. She can't get her muscle system together. It's an expression, it's a, it's, a, it's a range of things. But these people get out there and do it. And their solutions, by the way, benefit all of us. Everybody here has probably heard of statins, the drug. It was created for a rare disorder. Benefits all of us. So that's been my trip 
of living with, uh, living with zebras. Um, these two girls are, uh, I give them the credit for virtually everything uh, that I've gotten into and anything I ever will uh, get into. Uh, although my position right now is volunteer, it is one of the most rewarding positions I've ever had in my life. And it actually has given me an opportunity to take every skill set I've had and put it in one place. And it's, it's we're going to have a rare disease clinic in Albany. That's it. <laughs>